There's no fire in hell. There's no place that you go and get burned by fire forever. But there is such a thing as hellfire, and it's probably something that you've felt already. Hey, what's up, everybody? You might have heard the idea that you could possibly burn forever, literally burn forever in hell. There's an idea, a widespread idea out there that is, say, it says that this is the, the picture of how life works. We start in the world, right? You and I are living this life here, but God has some rules, and if you don't live by those rules, after you die, you go into the afterlife, you go over to hell, and you know what happens in hell? Burning. Fire is in hell. Hell is made of a ton of volcano type, super hot stuff, and you get burned forever for a punishment. Well, because you did, you did stuff that was wrong here. So God is burning you in hell forever. You heard that? That is freaking nuts. Have you ever been burned by fire? Like, have you ever been badly burned by fire? I haven't, but I've been burned a little bit, and it's terrible. Getting burned is one of the worst pains that you can feel. To be consumed completely by fire, there's no, what crime, there's no crime that would justify more than like 25 minutes of being completely burned in fire. But you're telling me that God, who is love itself and truth itself, is going to set that up? I've got an idea. I'm going to burn you all forever because you didn't do what I wanted you to do or because you did something that was wrong. Think if a person did that. They would be, that would be the new Hitler. Everybody would look and say, never be like that person. You'd hear they burned all their enemies forever because they didn't do what they wanted. It's absolutely not what God would do. And you know why God wouldn't do that? Because he doesn't have any hellfire inside him, the actual hellfire. There is hellfire, but it's not a chemical reaction like fire is here. It has to do with something that goes on inside of us. The best illustration I can think of is Cookie Monster. So when I eat the first part of a cookie, I'm talking about a regular cookie. There's a part of me that turns into Cookie Monster. <laughs> In case you haven't heard Cookie Monster. <clears throat> me want cookie. <laughs> really, there's a part of me that gets like that. Because I get that first bite and my mind can see there's the rest of that cookie there. And it's like, I gotta have that. I, if, if, if I try to not finish it, it's trouble. I am... This craving springs up inside of me. Eating cookies has nothing to do with hellfire. It's fine. Eat cookies. I hope that you enjoy them and love them. But that kind of craving, I think about when you really get the urge for something. Hellfire is that. But it's not a craving for cookies. It's a craving for something else. So we begin our reading from Swedenborg in Secrets of Heaven, 5,071, and we got to begin here with goats, because this is a part in the Bible where Jesus is talking about in some kind of end state, there's going to be sheep on the right hand and goats on the left hand, and the goats you're going to see have it really bad. There's actually a song, do you guys know Cake, the band Cake? When I was 14... They had this song out, it was called The Distance, and we thought it was the coolest song, and whenever it would come on the radio, because back then that's all you had, it was a big deal. Cake did a song, the, the chorus goes, sheep go to heaven, goats go to hell. You know that one? It's, it's because of this passage. And Cake, if you're watching, and I know you probably are, this is what that means. Sheep go to heaven, goats go to hell. Because, sorry, I'll leave this good thing alone. But I gotta say, that doesn't make any sense. 
That's probably why they chose it for the chorus. Why are goats that much morally worse than sheep? It's because they eat grass differently. What are you talking about? You also see it's talking about on the right and the left. And the, the goats are on the left, so those who are on the left, I'm left-handed, is this a political statement? What are you talking about? None of this is morality, but the inner meaning, the inner meaning, everything becomes crystal clear. So it says, those on the left, the goats, are described as cursed. What is that curse? And their punishment is called, there it is, eternal fire. Here's the quote from the Bible. Then he will also say to those on the left, go away from me, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and the devil's angels. And these will go away into eternal fire punishment. So we got eternal fire, which we're pretty sure is this eternal punishment. Sounds dire. This is because they turned away from goodness and truth toward evil and falsity. In the words inner meaning, being cursed means turning away. I was making light of this idea of the sheep and the goats and the left and the right and the, how that just doesn't seem to make any sense. Because when you take the Bible on its literal face value, if you hear the parables that Jesus tells without trying to ascertain their meaning, it doesn't make any sense. It's, it's borderline nonsensical and, and outright nonsensical in a lot of areas. And certainly not inspiring and moves you to worship God and, and say, wow, this is your mind laid out before me in these scriptures. No, but in the inner meaning, it shines. So, the curse, the inner meaning is all about each of our individual lives, because that's what God is interested in, is turning us away from hell, which is the desire to do what is evil, and toward heaven, which is the desire to do what is good, because then we can commune with God and have a happy life and not hurt each other, because that's what God is all about. So the turning away, the curse is the turning away from goodness and truth toward evil and falsity. God isn't cursing you. You are bringing misery on yourself when as God sends out love and truth everywhere, those who turn toward it and accept it and moves them into heaven, because heaven is the acceptance of that. But if we turn away and we say, I don't want that, the curse is not only not getting the joy of goodness and truth that you get in heaven, but it's bringing the misery that a life based on evil brings you. So that's the curse. What's the eternal fire? What is hellfire? And this is a great, great little mission statement for hellfire. The eternal fire they depart into is not physical fire, and it is not the torments of conscience. So it's not, okay, you're not being burned physically, but you're being so racked by guilt and shame over what you've done that you might as well be on fire. That's kind of like a loophole where you can still get punished by misery, but it's not physical. No. Hellfire is a craving for evil. Hellfire is the craving for evil. It's like I was talking about before. Cravings that, and it absolutely is just like fire. Notice when, when you're, you're triggered or you want something that you know is not good, it, blazes up. You don't think about it like that, but as soon as you have this concept in your mind, whenever something gets triggered like that, it's like, oh yeah, that's fire. Like I, I'm, I've got hell fire. I got a big old hell bonfire going in me right now. Our cravings are spiritual fires that consume us during bodily life and torment us in the other life. So there is some kind of torment in these cravings. They initially display themselves as kind of good. You want something because you think it's going to feel good. You want to yell at that person. You want to take 
what is theirs. You want to, you know, cheat on somebody because you think this is going to, this is going to be good. This is going to be great. And maybe you feel something like, ah, yeah, this person insulted me and then I humiliated them and it felt great. But there's a torment inside of that that is the pangs of hellfire. In the spiritual world, what's going on is everything that's deep inside us in this world that we kind of don't show to the world, there it's out in the open and it's what drives everything. So everybody who is full of love for the neighbor, they congregate this naturally. Their love draws them together. Everybody who enjoys harming the neighbor has the craving of hellfire inside them the same laws of spiritual physics apply, and so you have a group of people, all of whom deeply enjoy harming people in some way, doing things that are inherently harmful to other people. They all have hellfire burning in them. These fires drive hell's inhabitants to torture each other in horrendous ways. God doesn't torture anyone. There's no hellfire in God. There is no craving for evil or revenge and no justification of, well, these people have not lived up to my standards, so I can just crush them a little bit. There ain't none of that in God. God is the opposite, which we'll get to before the end of this. So don't worry, it's not going to be too bleak for the whole episode. But it's going to be bleak for a while in the hopes that we can learn this and learn to extinguish that hellfire in us whenever it pops up. If you've based your life around the joy of evil. Yeah, what you do is you look out, you, you go around, you look for targets, and you go do what you like. You, you go try to hurt them. Guess what? The next person over is doing the same thing, and they see you as a target. It's just the nature of hell. In heaven, everybody's looking with loving eyes toward who can I make happy? Oh, I see you, I wanna make you happy. And so I make you happy and you're doing the same thing and you make me happy and it's just the happiness multiplies. Hell is having to live with the reality of what you do. That you can go around and harm all these people and you think it's great. At some point, somebody's gonna do the same thing to you and you have to experience the full circle of it. God is not absent from that. Actually, actually, angels in heaven are constantly working to mitigate and stop and reduce the suffering as much as possible in hell. But because of the craving of hellfire, it can't be the suffering can't be eliminated. That is, it's as it said before, it's eternal fire, meaning it it cannot be satisfied. Nobody says like, okay, I've done enough of those things. It's it's progressively addictive to give in to the cravings of hellfire. So let's look a little bit more at the nature of hellfire and why, why fire? Why use that metaphor in the first place? That eternal fire is not physical fire stands to reason. Uh, that was the reasons I was given in the beginning. There's no way that there's going to be some situation where you're burning forever. It is not the torment of conscience because people who are awash in evil never have any conscience, and people who had no conscience during bodily life cannot have any in the other life either. We take our minds with us. It's not just, oh, we suddenly change after death. Who we are making ourselves into now, that state, you, you wake up in the other life and you, you still got your mind. You still got who you are. Eternal fire consists in cravings because all the fire of life comes from what a person loves. There's such a thing as heavenly fire, you know. Not all fire is bad. Fire is what lets, let the human race start to cook. And, and before electricity came along, we needed it for everything. Heavenly fire comes from a love for what is good and true. Hellish fire from a love for what is evil and false. So it's love driving both of them, but it's the object of that love. To say the same thing another way, heavenly fire comes from love for the Lord and love for one's neighbor. And hellish fire comes from love for oneself 
and love of worldly advantages. Love for oneself, love of worldly advantages. The love for oneself would be the love of our self-image. It, its mission statement could be, I am the greatest thing in the universe. I, and maybe if it didn't even say that out loud, it would say, I matter more than other people. In, in practice, I matter more than other people. Ugh, I'm at the back of this line. All these people are in front of me in this line. I'm getting to the, I'm gonna cut into the front of this line. Because, why? Because these are just things in my way. Who cares about them? I need to get where I'm going. These people, this person is driving in a way I don't like. Well, you know what I'm gonna do? Kill them. Because they're in my way. You think nothing of other people. You only think about yourself. And when other people, Ah, oh, you're so great. You're so great. You might think, yeah, I'm a, bene I'm so benevolent. Yes, but as soon as somebody doesn't pay you the respect you deserve, in whatever way, whether they they say something that you, that you don't like or they don't do what you want them to do, then it flares up. That is the fire that is burning inside of us. And just think about the way that chars everything in in life. You have, if you think about them like sticks, you have your your relationships, you have your, your, your mind and your morality, your spirituality, your, your connection to the rest of society. If this ego thing really runs amok and, and you really don't care about anyone, it just <laughs> chars all that stuff up, ruins all that stuff. The love of worldly advantages would be the same thing but for wealth. Like I, That person has something I want and I'm going to get it, or I, I want more. There's, gr there's enough greed that I'm going to do something that I know deprives somebody else, whether I can justify it or not. I know it deprives them, but I just want it. I want more stuff. I want more experiences. Same kind of blaze that happens there. Anyone who pays attention can see that this is the source of all the fire or warmth inside us. That is why love is called spiritual warmth and why love is all that is meant by fire and warmth in the word. So anywhere that you see it talking about fire or warmth throughout the entire Bible, it is talking about love, love in a positive sense or love in a negative sense. I'm not trying to say that all Fire, all emotional fire is bad. You should live a meek existence where you barely want anything and you, you never act with force or with determination. Fire can be great. The spiritual fire can be great. There is a distinct difference between what hell fire is inside us and what heavenly fire is inside us. And the, dare I say, the most important task in life is to start to first understand, oh, this is a fire on the other side and then start to differentiate which kind is this what am i feeling right now and when it's hellfire try to douse it and when it's heavenly fire feed that thing find whatever kindling whatever sticks you need to keep that going so here's the difference the fire of life in the evil is such that when their cravings intensify they also blaze up with an ardent rage to cause pain in others. I like to just think, because I might say to myself, well, I don't ever, I don't have that. But you, you kind of do in little ways. Just like, well, they, they didn't do that, so I'm going to punish them in this way. Or, or I'm going to do that. It's a small fire, but any fire can grow. And if we can, when it's nice and small like that, oh, I'm going to put that out. I'm going to put that out. I'm not going to act on that thing. I'm going to notice it and say to it, like, that's not the life that I want. I don't want that to grow. I'm not going to work from that. Hey, God, can you help me out with that? Can you bring your divine fire brigade? Send the angels with buckets and helicopters. Get that out of me. But here's the other kind of fire. The life of fire in the good is such that when they rise to a new level of desire, they also blaze up, but they blaze up with a loving zeal to help others. 
you can burn with a desire to right a wrong or, or to make an injustice just. You can burn with a desire to help the world. You can burn with a desire to provide for your family. You can burn with a desire to make a good life for your children. You can burn with a desire to get better at your job so that you can do good things. All of that is good. You could really look at heaven and hell, like this is heaven fire and this is hell fire. Heaven fire is the Lord's fire, which is the burning desire for everyone to be happy everywhere. And we are not going to stop until that is done. And we are going to go after that and, and leave no stone unturned in the quest to right every wrong, to heal everyone to the extent they can possibly be healed, to give them what makes a good life. Hellfire is, I, I'm going to rule everything, I'm going to get exactly what I want all the time, and I'm going to ch meaninglessly chase this thing, I don't even know what it is, it's going to lead to ruin for everything. This fire is the one that has a future in it. And actually, everyone who's got this fire burning in them wants to try to help these people to see, mm, that's not the right. C come over here. C come around and sit here by this campfire. There's a lot better going on. So, it sounds serious. Hellfire, it can be, but it doesn't have to be. This is something we can be looking for in ourselves, whether you just need a little candle snuffer to put that one out, or whether you need, yeah, the big guns to, to help you put out a big fire in yourself. That's the work of life, and it can be done with joy. It can be exciting to think, hey, the more that I put out this hellfire, it's a little less, it's a little less fire season for the human race. Because everything that we turn on the news and see that it's happening, and we don't like that it's happening, that's because of the hellfire that got out of control in somebody. So we can each do our part to practice spiritual fire safety, and we could see you know, the, the extinction of hellfire and the, the, the age of controlled, useful, loving, helpful heaven fire spread out of control in a good way. <laughs>